Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture guide number four, which you'll all be happy to know, I'm sure, is a rather short lecture. Uh, it's on what uh, three different stylistic movements happening um, from about the 1830s, uh, frankly, all the way until the 1880s, 1890s, but we're just going to be looking at the key moments here. Um, and these movements are French academicism, naturalism, and realism. <clears throat> So last time we were back in America uh, looking at American landscape painting and representations of uh, American Indians and this week we've returned to Europe and and we're going to be spending our time in France again. Remember that France at this moment is kind of the cultural center of the world because of the French Royal Academy and all of those things that we've been talking about. Um, the the key stylistic movement for today, although we'll get to it at the end, is realism because it's the one that's kind of um, unlike what we've seen so far and it's a stylistic movement that has a very large impact on what comes after, uh, including artists like uh, Edward Manet and Edgar Degas and some of the Impressionists and frankly, a lot of the work of art that happens at the end of the 19th century that has a social purpose um, as its main goal. Um, but with that being said, let's kind of very quickly, or at least relatively quickly, move our way through a couple of examples of French academicism uh, and naturalism before we get to realism. So at this point, again, make sure that you've done the reading. There's only textbook reading for this. Uh, as well as downloaded your lecture guide uh, and have that in front of you. So the first work we're looking at is a work by a French academic painter. Um, so he was a member of the French Royal Academy and exhibited in the French academic salon uh, by the name of uh, Adolphe William Bouguereau. Um, Bouguereau's work is fairly well known because it's all over the place. He was a very prolific artist if you've been to the Seattle Art Museum or you've been to the Fry Art Museum, there are numerous examples of his work there. And you're looking at a work here called The Birth of Venus from somewhere around 1880 or so. So we've jumped in this, uh, in this work kind of ahead of all the other works you'll be looking at. But Bouguereau was working from the 1870s forward. So I'm really just using this as an example of something known as French academicism by this point. French Academy painting, in other words, works that were produced by the, for the Royal Academy in the middle of the century still retain many of the same features of neoclassical art, but by the middle of the century, um, most of the painters figured out that the most lucrative form of painting uh, was to create works like this, um, examples of the female nude again. So we've talked about this in great detail um, when we were talking about not this work in particular, but other works on this same subject, when we were looking at jean Auguste Dominique Ang in particular early on. And there's really not a whole lot more, frankly, to say, so let's rehearse these ideas. Um, first of all, French academicism specifically means works that come out of what was expected by the French Royal Academy of this time. And by this time, again, starting much before this work was actually painted by 1840s into the 50s and the 60s and all the way up until the 80s, the most popular art form in the academies was the female nude, partially because, of course, it fulfills all the things that classical works of art are supposed to fulfill. It's about truth, beauty, and goodness, and so forth. Um, but uh, to put a fine point on it, it's also a work of art that appeals to the heterosexual male viewer. It's a series, one after another, of beautiful nude women um, set up, as we said before, in a kind of passive mode so that you can look at them as objects of your desire and you get to play the role of the voyeur. Remember how that works. Um, so. So again, we're just kind of rehearsing these ideas in front of this work. First of all, as I said before, almost all of these works are entitled Venuses. Venus, of course, is the Roman name for the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love and beauty. And as we've already covered here, this is 
then by titling them this, um, it allows the artist to depict nudity and sometimes very erotic nudity, <clears throat> but uh, in the fine art venue uh, in a way that doesn't get anyone upset about it because it's got all of these long histories, all these conventions that accompany it. What Berger calls, you know, the, the clothing of the nude, meaning all the conventions that allow us to see this nude as something more than just um, someone without their clothes on, as being about art with a capital A and beauty with a capital B and, and all of those things that we've already covered. So the titling of these works is important right off the bat. But then remember the other part of this is that um, idealizing this female body is what is also allowing it to be depicted. You can't just represent an everyday nude woman. Something that looks realistic would be kind of scandalous. They have to be idealized. They have to be perfected because that's what brings them into the proximity of God or truth and goodness and so forth. And so while to, by today's standards, maybe this isn't, you know, your ideal perfect woman's body, at the time, of course, that's the way they thought of these things. She is set up again um, to allow us to look at her. She doesn't look back at us. So this helps to objectify her, um, someone who gets to be looked at but doesn't look in return. A figure who is not naked because we don't wonder what her feelings are, what her desires are. Everything's about us, the presumed heterosexual male viewer. Now surrounding her are some figures that aren't all that important. Most of them that are in the water <clears throat> are what are known as nymphs, right? Kind of lesser um, deities of the water. Um, up above are what we call puti figures. They're basically angelic figures that look a little bit like one of them is definitely Cupid. The rest just look like Cupid. And frankly, they're all just in there um, <clears throat> to allow us kind of, you know, more things to look at in addition to the female nude. Now, Venus here is almost always depicted coming into shore at her birth on a half shell. Um, the half shell is a uh, a symbol of purity, believe it or not. And in, in the original Greek story, as I think I said before, um, Aphrodite, uh, which is the Greek name for this goddess, her birth is something that's a heck of a lot more sexualized. But, but by here, we've, we've cleaned that up. And if you're interested in that story, just Google the birth of Aphrodite. So um, I presume we already know all those ideas and we, you know, I don't want to bore you with rehashing them again over and over again. But I do want to um, stop to say how complicated these kinds of cover stories for female nudity become. Um, and what I mean by that is that, remember I said before, you know, it's one thing to depict a woman without her clothes on um, for a private audience. It's another in the high realm of art to depict women without their clothes on and, and kind of get away with it where everyone accepts this as a high form of art and not something scandalous. And we saw how the American public wasn't ready for it, but this long tradition in Europe allows people to be okay with it. Now those cover stories keep getting a little bit more complicated. And, um, and again, you know, cover story may not be the greatest term for this, but it's the one that I'm going to use to say what allows the depiction of female nudity in a society, very Judeo-Christian, in which eroticism in the high realm of art isn't something that is, you know, particularly acceptable. How are we to understand these things as about truth or moralizing when they seem to be about kind of erotic titillation? What you're looking at here is a work by Bouguereau again called Nymphs and a Satyr. And nymphs again are kind of lesser goddesses of the water. Yes, it is the root word where we get the term nymphomaniac. Because in all the old Greek stories, the nymphs were more than happy to have sexual dalliances with whoever they came across if they were, you know, excited about it. And in this case, a satyr, if you don't know, is a half man, half goat. And in all the Greek stories, the satyrs, like any half man, half animal, are ruled by their animal passions. So think of the, the centaurs that are half horse, half man. Um, these are creatures that show in the Greek myths uh, their bestial side so that we can learn and try to control 
those kind of primal um, desires of humanity. That's a long way around saying that for the most part, if a satyr was approached by a nymph and asked, uh, you know, to have a sexual encounter, they would all be down with that. There wouldn't be a question about it. So here, what we have is a satyr who's being dragged into the water, a symbol, by the way, um, water uh, and ponds and, and bathtubs are symbols of sexual encounters. Um, by one, two, three, four beautiful nymphs, and yet he is resisting. Now, this might seem preposterous, and in a rational way it is. They're playfully pulling him in uh, to a sexual encounter, and he's saying, no, 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 even though he represents the kind of primal passions of mankind. But the rationale behind this is is this. It's saying that he is trying to hold himself back from this animal urge. Um, he's probably going to fail, but he's doing the right thing by resisting. <clears throat> you know, this type of sexual encounter is not something that is uh, really okay in the world of 19th century France, obviously. Um, it's not something that art should espouse, uh, that uh, even if it is a male fantasy. Uh, instead, it should be, because it is art, um, filled with a moral message. And this moral message is, reser uh, you know, kind of resist your deepest fantasies here. Resist this, this temptation because you know better about it. Now, the reason I called this a cover story is that, of course, um, the whole idea of this moralizing lesson that we should resist our animal desires uh, is, you know, a part of this work, but it's really a part of this work that covers up the fact that really what we're excited about, or we presume that the 19th century French heterosexual man who bought this would be excited about, is the depiction of four beautiful women uh, in various states of, uh, you know, being unclothed, um, very excited about a sexual encounter with whoever. What we call this type of dynamic in which you have a kind of moralizing lesson on the surface, in this case, resist um, these animal temptations that allows the very kind of pleasure in imagining the temptation that it's saying don't go along with, we call this a double articulation. Two things at once, saying on the one hand, don't do this, and then showing you, you know, mass amounts of beautiful female flesh, which is the real reason why people are buying this. Now, this is a really important term, so I'll pick it up again here with another Bouguereau work. This is a work that is um, a little bit closer to us. The others are in Europe. This one is down at the uh, Getty Museum just outside of LA. It's by Bouguereau again called uh, Young Girl Defending Herself Against Eros. Now Eros means love um, and of course Eros here is Cupid who is trying to um, to poke this so to speak, poke this uh, young, beautiful woman with a uh, one of his arrows that will inflame her desire, and she is resisting that. So on its surface, the moralizing message is about chastity. It's, it's really supposed to be saying, uh, supposedly, um, to young women, resist your desires, right? Don't let guys talk you into things. Don't get caught up with your passions. There are, you know, in 19th century France and even today, there are all these rationales, whether they be religious or practical about, uh, you know, saving yourself for marriage and so forth. So on its overt level, it's saying, I am a painting that's about telling young women uh, to resist their desires. And on the other hand, you know, the reason people are buying this is it's a beautiful woman um, in a state of undress with a figure kind of climbing into her lap that we get to look at and imagine um, in, in whatever way we want to in a, in a fairly, I would presume, erotic way. So the devil articulation here again is one in which the, the very kind of moralizing lesson, the idea of chastity, allows for the fantasy of thinking of this woman in very erotic terms. The cover story actually um, allows for 
or authorizes um, this art in the first place. Or another way to put this is, the reason that this is acceptable as high art is that it has a moralizing lesson. It says, hey, I'm about chastity. However, that overt message is uh, has an implicit message to it too, and that's really the reason why people are buying this. They want a picture of a beautiful young woman who they can imagine in an erotic scenario during a day where, of course, they don't have the internet, they don't have movies that sexualize people all over the place. These are their forms of um, visual fantasy. And again, just to remind us, in the realm of art, it just wasn't acceptable as it might be, let's say, in a movie today, something like Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever, um, to show a, a kind of straightforward fantasy, a sexual fantasy, because the mores of the time are such that that's not allowable, certainly not within the high realm of art. And so to get those fantasies into the picture, you need something that kind of covers them up or makes them okay. And that's part of the devil articulation. Two things being said at once, both of which support each other, one that covers the other up. So I'm just showing you this very briefly because it's going to come back um, in next week's lecture when we look at the work of Edouard Manet and the Impressionists. This is a work um, comes out of academic classicism by Alexander Cavanel called The Birth of Venus Again. And in 1863, which you'll find out next week is a very important date, this work won the prize for the best of all the female nudes. And that year, there were over 300 female nudes being hung in the grand academic salon. Same kind of thing, right? Beautiful woman, Venus again, um, being birthed here, uh, floating in on a wave and all the things that go along with that. Around the same time, so starting in the 18, late 1840s in particular, these things start getting particularly popular, but it continues all the way to the end of the century. We have the emergence of landscape painting in the French Royal Academy um, as well. Um, first of all, with a series of painters that were oftentimes known as the Barbizon School, um, which is a reference to the place that they painted See, there was this kind of little artistic community outside of Paris near the Forest of Fontainebleau um, called Barbizon. And a lot of painters seeking to get out of the big city of Paris and to return people to kind of the natural environment went to Barbizon and painted these natural landscape scenes um, that were seen again as kind of moralizing in some of the same ways that we talked about last week. That the city was a corrupting force, but nature was something closer to God. And that by filling your homes with natural scenes, you would be closer to that kind of uh, cradle of God. This, um, this art form, though, also, besides being called the Barbizon School, gets associated with a stylistic label known as naturalism. Naturalism um, really means pictures of nature that, or pictures that set figures in nature that, and you'll see this kind of drawn out today over the lecture, that don't really have an overt political message. They're not about social change. They're really about kind of maintaining the status quo of affairs um, rather than realism, which as you'll see coming up, and those are kind of close terms, aren't they? Naturalism and realism has a kind of political edge to it. So just very briefly, I wanted to show you a couple of these naturalistic works. They're much uh, more uh, kind of enticing in person. This is a work by Jean-Baptiste Camille Coro, um, known as Morning Dance of the Nymphs. And basically what you're seeing in this medium-sized painting is some kind of Arcadian scene, remember that kind of utopian scene, of a natural environment where nymphs are living um, very bucolically or happily within nature um, and enjoying themselves. People would buy these works and hang them in their you know, homes in Paris so as to be reminded of the beauty of nature and, and feel in tune with that nature. The Barbizon School, just like those painters in the United States uh, around the same time period, were going out into nature and painting with an easel set out 
in front of trees and such. Uh, They're painting, as the French call it, en plein air, or in full air, um, which was a fairly new phenomenon of the 19th century. Before this time period, because it was so hard to grind your own paints and set up an easel and set up your palette outside. Most landscape paintings that you see, uh, for instance, in the 18th century and before, are all scenes that weren't painted in front of a natural environment. They were all painted in a studio. So that's, that's worth knowing. Um, you see, one of the technological advances of the 19th century is they began to have uh, bottled and tubed paints that you could just go buy from an art store and you wouldn't have to do all this work when you're out in the field. So en plein air or in full air painting is something that is very closely associated with naturalism. This is just one more work by Jean-Baptiste Camille Cauro called uh, Ville d'Avre. Um, it's a scene of, uh, again, of a peasant girl who's in the middle of that beautiful nature, just living in one with nature. A little bit different, but still a part of the naturalistic, stylistic movement is the work of Rosa Bonheur. Um, Rosa Bonheur is one of the few women artists that we've seen so far. She's a kind of interesting character. Um, she painted primarily scenes like this, known as plowing in the Nineveh, the dressing of the vines. Uh, of animals, uh, horses, and in this case, oxen, uh, in their natural environment. <clears throat> she was a woman. Um, she was raised in a non-traditional family uh, by parents who, um, who worshipped a female deity. They're part of the Rosicrucianist group. Um, and uh, later in life, I mean, she was almost assuredly a, a lesbian woman before anyone really labeled uh, women lesbians. Um, but it's an interesting story because she would go out into nature and she was kind of flouting all the social conventions of the time, uh, smoking cigars and hanging out with her women friends. And she had to get special dispensation from the French government to wear pants because women weren't allowed to wear pants, believe it or not. You have to kind of take yourself back to this world uh, and see... Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, again, about Rosa Bonheur is that she was one of the few that was able to break some of these conventions. In any case, um, this painting was something that was actually commissioned by the French state itself uh, in order to symbolically represent the fertility and productivity of France. See, the Nineveh, which is part of the title of this work, uh, is a, a very rich agricultural place in France, kind of a, a breadbasket of France, um, where a lot of the produce is created. And um, by extension, this loamy ground that you see here, the kind of heroic low viewpoint that makes the oxen look so big, is supposed to heroicize this natural you know, farming pastime. And by symbolic extension, the fertility and productivity of France in order to export goods and to take care of its people and so forth. And that's what Rosa Bonheur primarily did. The major artist of the naturalist group, though, that I, I want to spend a little bit more time on, just frankly because he'll be a good um, comparison to the realist, is this artist, uh, Jean-Francois Millet. It looks like Millet, but the French pronounce it Millet. And what you're looking at here is the Angelus. <clears throat> Millet, uh, Millet worked for a while out of Barbizon, but most of his patrons were people in Paris who bought these scenes of um, kind of low class peasantry working in a, you know, a very difficult way. Um, but his paintings, of course, always glorify the difficulty of these peasants. And that's the key feature to naturalism. Scenes in this case, the Angelus is, um, we can just look at this together and say, it's two peasant people who have been working all day long, probably, in the fields for a very meager existence. Um, and yet when the church bell bells um, start ringing to signal the Angelus, and the Angelus, if you don't know, and probably no one does, was an old ritual in which Various times throughout the day, the church bells would ring and people would stop what they were doing and pay their respects to, to God and to heaven and so forth. Those church bells, and you can see the church in the background here off to the woman's right-hand side, or off to our right-hand side, um, 
have stopped them in the middle of their very hard day and they're they're you know paying their respects to god they're showing their thanks to god for what they have even if that's a really meager existence now the reason that i wanted to talk about this some is it glorifies the difficulty of the lower classes and on the one hand that might seem like a wonderful thing because after all there are very few scenes in the history of art of the lower classes because most of the work is produced by and for the upper classes. But in comparison to realism, this naturalistic work in glorifying the plight of the lower classes doesn't really make us want to change it. It just makes us stop and think for a minute, wow, look at how tough their life is. But we don't really, uh, we're not provoked into saying that's unfair. How do we change their lot in life? And we'll see that the realist, by comparison, try to provoke us into some type of social change. Another work by Mie called The Sower. <clears throat> what we see here is a lower class man throwing seeds out into the field. He's sowing the field with something and almost as quickly as he's throwing those seeds down, you can see in the background some probably crows swooping in to eat up those seeds. But he doesn't have a care in the world. Uh, Mie described this kind of open mouth that he has as a, a man who is singing while he's doing this very hard labor. Um, and he would have been doing this day after day after day. Uh, and of course, this isn't his field. It's probably someone else who is going to harvest it and make the money off of it. Um, and so it's another kind of glorification of the pastoral life of the lower classes. What I also wanted to talk about though in front of this work because it's easier to see is how roughly this is painted. This doesn't look like a Bouguereau, does it? It doesn't look like that high fidelity, almost photographic realism. And the reason for that isn't that Mie didn't know how to paint very well. The reason is that he thought that this type of style, very rustic and very kind of rugged looking surface, not polished at all, was much more in line with his subject, the lower class people, than let's say a highly polished, really uh, kind of perfect looking classical work. So many painters will start affecting a style. In other words, they're making this look really rough surface, not really polished because they think it goes along with or is commensurate with the subject matter, in this case, the lower classes. Finally, um, maybe Mie's most famous work, or an icon of naturalism, this is a work called The Gleaners. Now, the subject, gleaning, is something that goes back as far as the Old Testament. It's talked about in the Old Testament. It's a, a form of charity in which way back in biblical times and all the way up until this contemporary moment, rich landowners would allow the lower, lower classes after they had already harvested, in this case, wheat, um, they would allow the lower classes to come up and glean or pick up anything that was left over, all the chaff and little pieces of wheat so that they could make their bread. In other words, it's a form of charity that is uh, given to the lowest of the low um, to make their life a little bit better. In this work, we see in the foreground three women gleaners um, who are, you know, their, their hands are very dark, their faces are very dark, they've been out in the sun probably their entire life. They're doing back-breaking labor, just picking up these little pieces of wheat uh, to eke out uh, subsistence, while in the background you see the harvest continuing on and big, huge bales of wheat back there. Now, on the one hand, you could stop and think, wow, you know, it's unfair that these people have to work so hard when look at all that plenty behind them in the harvest. But that's not really what Mie is getting at. What Mie is trying to say again is he's trying to glorify the difficulty of these people's lives without seeking to change it. There's nothing in this that really says, hey, ladies, stop doing what you're doing. Uh, take up your pitchforks and let's have another revolution so that all classes are raised equally. Um, he's just trying to kind of glorify the difficulty of their life. And as I said before, we'll see quite a difference between this and realism. And speaking of realism, here is our first realist artist. This is Honoré Daumier's work called Gargantua from the early 1830s. Um, Henri Damier was a painter and a printmaker. 
Um, this work is a lithograph, uh, which is a fairly inexpensive and quick form of printing. Uh, he chose printing as a primary medium because he wanted very political social messages in his work. And, you know, if you're just creating a single painting, um, someone has to come see that painting uh, wherever you exhibit it. But if you are doing prints, you can publish these in magazines, which he did in a magazine called Caricature over and over again, or in books, or you can, you know, create multiple prints and hang them up all over a city. Um, they're cheaper to produce and you can disseminate them much further. And so they lend themselves to works of art that are concerned with um, giving social messages to people. Around the time that Daumier created this, um, you know, this is right after the so-called July Revolution that you saw in uh, Delacroix's work, Liberty Leading the People. And after the July Revolution, a new monarchy uh, was put into power, believe it or not, to replace the old restored monarchy, and was supposed to be checked by parliamentary systems again. But Daumier is skeptical of this, and the man who was put into power, the new monarch, his name was Louis Philippe, um, a member of the Bourbon dynasty, if I remember correctly. And almost immediately, of course, just like his predecessor, he filled the parliament with his cronies and he started raising taxes and so forth. And that's what you see here. Off to the little right, so follow my cursor, you see members of the lower class in kind of, uh, you know, ragged clothing, uh, putting their taxes into these little bushels that are then taken up this, this ramp or conveyor belt into the mouth of uh, what is a likeness of Louis Philippe sitting on his throne. And Louis Philippe just keeps getting bigger and bigger, fatter and fatter off of the hard work of the lower classes who can barely afford it. Um, this is, you know, a way, uh, it's not so dissimilar than various critiques of government today where big government gets bloated and asks too much for us and we get very little in return. Um, but this is, you know, over almost 200 years uh, before our present day. And Daumier even makes a little, you know, quip about um, what you get in return here. Um, Louis Philippe sitting on his throne is literally crapping out legislation. I mean, so here comes this legislation as if he's crapping it out and his cronies, all of these legislators are running back to this building in the background, which is actually a, a famous building in Paris known as the Pantheon um, to proclaim the next greatest law. So the, the message is pretty straightforward. Big government puts into office their cronies. It gets fatter and fatter off the hard work of the lower classes and we should change that. And that's the key feature that separates realism from naturalism. They're both about kind of lowbrow subjects, but realism wants to change the status quo, where naturalism just kind of glorifies the status quo. Going one step further, you know, if we we're in a face-to-face -face meeting, I would say something like, if Louis Philippe were a fruit, what fruit would he be? Um, because this is another visual pun that is put into this work by uh, Daumier. He looks like a pear, and in French, the term pear, which is poire, is a slang word for a moron. So he's calling him a moron. And he's doing this, by the way, at a time in which there was no kind of free press. If you did something like this, you could get in a lot of trouble, which he did. He ended up spending, depending on which account you believe, either six or nine months in prison for this work. But right after he got done with this work and right after he got done, uh, got out of prison, he went right back to it. He published this on his return, which is called um, King Louis Philippe, the past, present and future, meaning he's not going to change at all. It's the three faces that are just the same. Uh, and then in a little, again, verbal pun, he prints his, his initials backwards as if this is somehow going to hide who did this. H.D. Honoré Daumier. He didn't get in trouble for this one. And that's what he did for the most part in his career, print after print with social message after social message. And if you think of this as being similar to political cartoons, they are. They're just really well done political cartoonage. So this one, for instance, is called Rue Transnonin. Um, 
which is a specific street in uh, a part of France, uh, industrial city in France, um, where a horrible tragedy occurred that had something to do with um, the plight of the lower classes again. You see, in this um, southern city in France, kind of southern central city in France, known as Lyon, um, where the textile production of France was, there were these huge factories that produced textiles, and the working people um, were really, um, you know, working for very poor wages in really dangerous situations. The weaving industry and textiles were notorious for, uh, for the deaths that occurred here. And these people were trying to, uh, it was an early form of trying to organize labor to have a kind of collective bargaining, what we would call later on, um, um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the various guilds or the various unions. Now, when these unions first started, though, and you may know these stories, um, because the same thing happened in the United States and various parts of the world, the factory owners would actually hire uh, mercenaries sometimes or get the government involved to stop the workers from organizing. And in this case, the, uh, the government was in town kind of making sure that there was rest and keeping the peace and so forth. Um, and they were monitoring the places that these lower class people lived, which were these kind of high rise, what are called tenement buildings, very cheap apartments where you put labor, kind of like dormitories. Um, but very cheap ones um, to house the labor forces. And they were wandering uh, through these uh, tenement buildings when people started crying out to them, the working class from the tenements, and throwing garbage down on them. And they rushed into one of these tenements, and in a, you know, um, a show of excessive force, they ended up shooting a lot of people, including um, this entire family. And what you see here is the death of a father uh, kind of right in the center uh, but underneath him is his child and his wife off to the left and his father off to the right. All have been killed in this this horrible kind of excessive force um, exerted by the police, which unfortunately we know still occurs today. But since the French press was primarily controlled by the government, Daumier created this picture thinking that pictures are worth a thousand words and publish these in what are known as broadsides, little political pamphlets or cheaply produced um, alternative uh, newspapers so that the public would be aware of these events. And it could be a rallying cry for social change. Sometimes his works are one-liners, such as this one. Uh, what we see here is a man who has died. He was a political prisoner chained to his bed um, the man who is in the white top hat here, the fat guy, sorry, that's probably not uh, politically correct, the um, very obese man is uh, what is known as a legislator uh, of the time, a parliamentarian. We actually just saw him, I'm going to back up here, these guys are everywhere down here, um, right, these parliamentarians in their uh, coats with tails. Um, so he's a member of the official member of the government checking his pulse and next to him is because of his hat we know who he is he's a church official known as a beadle um, b-e-a-d-l-e -E, which are official kind of church uh, monitors and they both come to pay their last respects except really what it says down below in french is okay now it's safe to release this one so it's a one-liner He's died, now it's safe to release him. And the government, whether it be the legislator or parliamentarian or the beadle, who is a church official paid by the government, both are signing off on this. One of Daumier's most famous paintings, and I'm only showing you one of these, is this work, which is called Third Class Carriage. Now I wanna go over this fairly quickly. I don't wanna get us too bogged down. But you're probably getting the idea, right? Daumier is wanting to show us the very difficult situation of the lower classes in a way that provokes our emotional empathy so that we stand up and fight for them and fight for some kind of social change. This picture is about the subject of the lower classes um, being pushed out on the one hand of Paris. We'll learn about this um, more in a minute and more next week. Um, Paris in the middle of the century was greatly renovated under the rule 
of uh, Louis the Third, um, Louis Napoleon first, or Napoleon the Third, as he later called himself. He was the grand nephew of Napoleon. Um, and when Paris was renovated, so as to create these grand boulevards that you can see today, um, a lot of the lower classes got pushed out of Paris. It was gentrified, right? It got too expensive for them to have houses. And if you've never seen Paris before, it's just about the biggest city you'd ever see with sprawling suburbs going, you know, 20 miles off into the distance. And at this time, of course, transportation was such that a lot of people um, took the, the early form of public transit into Paris, which is what you're seeing here, these giant horse-drawn carriages. Um, and in this case, you're looking at people who are in the third class. So not the second class, not the first class, but the lowest class, the cheapest class into town. Now, the reason I bring all this up is that some enterprising social historian was able to kind of um, approximate or guess the n amount of time that these people of the lower classes spent on average when it came to their round trip commute to work. And it's almost four hours that they came up with. So start thinking about this. If it took them on average almost four hours on their daily commute, you know, almost two hours each way, and if the average working day for these people was around 12 hours, there were no labor laws or none that were really enforced at this time. You're talking about a person who spends about 16 hours of their day at work or traveling to or from work. And what else do they have to do with their lives? What else can they do? Where is their leisure time? What else do they have energy for? Now, for the most part, what Dalmier would say is that we ignore these people, we don't look at them. And what he's done here is that he's placed us by the viewpoint of the picture in the third class with them so that we can see their world. And behind them, what you see, so these three characters are in the third class. Behind them, you see people with top hats on. These are middle-class people. And every once in a while, you see someone with a rumpled hat here. This is probably a lower-class person or a working class person behind them. And these people are all conversing, right? They have enough energy to still be talking while these people have no energy left to talk. And then you see other things like, why is this kid here? You know, shouldn't he be in school? Well, he probably should be in school, but he has to help support his family. So he's probably being carted in to work. And why is this woman who's probably working as a, you know, a house cleaner taking her infant child into work well, because she doesn't have anyone else to help her out with this. So again, what Domi is saying is here are the people that we don't see that are kind of invisible in the world who have these incredibly difficult lives. Why don't you take a quick trip with them in the third class to just see what their life is like? And maybe that will move you to want to change their way of life. Um, just one last kind of one liner here by Domi. This is his critique of the French Royal Academy, which, as I said before, by the middle of the century is just most of the things that you would see on the walls are, are uh, you know, beautiful, glossy, academic nudes. And what he is imagining here are two women going to the French academic salon, uh, average, you know, let's say housewives, and seeing all these female nudes and what type of effect does it have on a woman? Uh, to see these nudes. And down below in French it says, this year again Venuses, there are always Venuses, like there are really women built like that. I mean, it's the, the kind of early stage of feminist lament over, you know, all of these depictions of, of male fantasy, beautiful women that then everyday women feel like they have to live up to in one way or another. It's that what Berger calls uh, you know, that that kind of surveillance that happens where we where women interiorize the views of society and try to act according to what is expected or admired or esteemed or desired from them. So I'm going to pause here for a minute. Again, you'll see very little uh, and I'll come back to the major character of today um, in two seconds, Corbe. So Gustave Courbet is probably the most famous of all the realist painters. This is an early 
self-portrait by Corbet. He was a very charismatic, handsome, um, very articulate member of the upper middle class who was able to um, really put realism on the map in the French Royal Academy, meaning he exhibited all the works that you'll see in the French Royal Academy right alongside those things like, uh, you know, although it's later in time, uh, Jacques uh, Louis David's Oath of the Haraci, that type of neoclassical work or the academic classical works of Bouguereau and so forth. But he was doing this because he wanted to upset classicism. He wanted to change what he thought was an art world ruled by conservative values, uh, and especially around the time of 1848, where his career takes a marked turn, his work is filled with political messages. Now, I point out that date, 1848, because that's the year that um, Louis Philippe, who you just saw in Daumier's work, that restored monarch, is ousted in a popular um, election by uh, Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon, who then goes on a few years later in a coup d'etat to take over the French state and proclaim the Third Republic or, uh, I'm sorry, the Second Republic, the Second Empire, as it later gets called, and proclaim himself uh, Napoleon III. But it was a popular uprising again at this time. Um, it was promised in 1848 to, um, you know, return to the values that are originally espoused the French Revolution, even though a lot of people were skeptical about any big revolution again. In any case, in 1848, with all of these things happening uh, in French politics, as well as things happening in the larger realm of social issues in the world, Corbet changes his work from things that look like Mie's work or naturalist works to works that look like this in order to, as I said before, change the status quo of affairs. Um, just to mention one big thing, 1848, of course, is the year that the Communist Manifesto is written. And Marx and Engels, of course, famous manifesto. Um, don't mistake this as what communism became, let's say, in the middle of the 20th century in, in China or in Russia. The Communist Manifesto originally, early on, was espoused by a lot of people as a pathway to um, to to upsetting the, you know, the way that the world is set up to, to privilege certain people and to keep other people kind of downtrodden. And the whole idea of communism in the first place was to even out all things and to raise that vast majority of people who belong to the lower class to a place in life where they were happy and had some kind of, you know, possibility of, um, of, you know, moving forward socially and economically and so forth. In any case, um, Corbet was interested in these ideas. And this work that you're looking at here uh, is called A Burial at Ornan. And it's a very good example of the way that he sought to upset classical aesthetics through a very ordinary subject. So first of all, I have to say, because you'd never guess it, this work is enormous. It's basically all these figures, think of them as being life-size. It's over 20 feet wide, and that type of size of painting was always something that was reserved for really important subjects, right? The type of subject that Nicholas Poussin talked about all the time, a grand subject. But here it's nothing grand. This isn't any important person being buried. As the title says, it's a burial at Ornan. And Ornan is just, uh, it happens to be the hometown of Corbet, not a particularly important place. So someone's being buried here. Um, historians have figured out it's probably his maternal grandfather, Corbet's that is, but that's not really important. It's just showing you the passing of a person. So right off the bat, think of all the rules that Poussin um, laid out for great works of art. And what you're going to see is Corbet breaking every one of those rules. So number one, Poussin said, every great work of art has to start with a grand subject. Well, this isn't a grand subject. It's just an everyday burial. Number two, Poussin said, they have to be organized around 
a central concept? Well, it'd be really hard to say what the concept of this work is. It doesn't have a straightforward message. It's just like a documentary shot of what a funeral looks like. And that's upsetting it as well. Number three, Poussin said all works have to be structured, organized, you know, follow this logic of uh, foreground, middle ground, background, a focal point, and so forth. This one doesn't have it. If you find your eye kind of wandering around to various points of interest, like, wow, what, what is this cross doing up here? If you can't read this very well, the cross is actually being held on a stick by this guy. If then you look at the red for a minute and you're like, okay, that's kind of interesting. If you look at the hole here, if you look at the dog, if you're just kind of wandering around but not figuring out what the focal point is, that's because there's no focal point. He actually called this composition an anti-composition, right? So it doesn't have any of those things. It's just like you would come across in everyday life. If you start looking at the figures, they're not idealized. They don't you know, partake of any canon of proportions. He's just showing you the real world as it exists and saying there is no reason why an everyday passing of a person is any less important than the passing of a great general or of Jesus on the cross or what have you. As a matter of fact, he seems to want to make a commentary on some of these things. So getting you in close here, you see these figures in red. They're clearly juxtaposed against this uh, priest. I presume he's a priest who's getting ready to read the uh, passage from the Bible, a, a kind of eulogizing message here. But look at them. They don't look happy to be there. This guy looks like, dude, just get on with it already. I have other places to be. Well, he happens to be dressed in the, in the, the outfit of a beadle again, B-E-A-D-L-E who are church officials, who are, again, they're people who the state pays and they don't want to be there. They just, they, they, they want to go on to something else. So he, the main priest, is acting solemn and doing the right thing. These people over here look like they want to be somewhere else. If you look at you know, this is far off to the right hand side. The people who have come to pay their respects, they're not idealized. They look like everyday people uh, in various states of lament. And that's supposed to be, again, a way of critiquing classical aesthetics and making you think about everyday folk. Now, of course, if you're a an artist, this is just a uh, you know, a simple kind of sideline. If you're an artist and you're trying to affect a massive change in the art world, you can't do it alone. There's no way for me to emphasize in this class will make it seem as if the French Academy wasn't that big of a deal because all we look at are things that are kind of not in the classical tradition, not part of the French Academy. But the French Academy was the biggest thing happening all the way through the 19th century. If we were in France during the 19th century, most of the things we would see hanging in galleries or certainly in the salon would all be classical works of art. The only reason that these types of art history classes um, focus on things like, you'll see here, realism, romanticism, impressionism, later on we'll see cubism and so forth. The reason we focus on those is these are the stylistic movements that were the starting point, kind of the the nascent forms of alternatives to the classical tradition that in historical hindsight seem to have been the most important things going on, but they weren't all that important during their own day. That's a long way around saying that if you are a realist painter and all of the money, all of the traditions, all the conventions, all the people in the know, all the power structures behind classicism, you need some people in your uh, court as well. Always happens this way. So in France, one of the people who greatly supported realism and later on people like Manet, not so much the Impressionists, although some Impressionism he liked, were people like this man that you see here. This is Courbet's portrait of Charles Baudelaire. And Charles Baudelaire, who was an author and a poet, was also an amateur and by amateur, I mean he didn't really get paid for it, um, art critic who people really respect, respected. And this great literary master supported realism, so people started taking realism seriously. 
You also need, um, you know, political leaders on your side. And so I just show you this, this portrait of Pierre Joseph Proudhon and his children. Pierre Joseph Proudhon was a very, very progressive politician of his time. He was a member of the French parliament. He was actually in correspondence with Marx and Engels. He was a very kind of left-leaning uh, progressive. And so, for instance, one of the things he's really well known for is proposing that France establish a central bank that would give no interest loans to the lower classes to start their own business so that they could rise into the middle class and beyond. And he was a close personal friend of Courbet's and they had lots of discussions about these types of social issues. Courbet also had a money man on his side, a left-leaning, um, uh, you know, guy who is basically a millionaire of his age. This is Alfred Brujas. And Alfred Brujas basically purchased anything Courbet, you know, wanted him to buy. He had a lot of rich friends in the world who he also talked uh, to about buying Courbet's work. And later on, when Courbet wanted to hold his own exhibition, Bruyas helped fund that as well. So this is basically the some indication of the support structure that allowed realism to really emerge as a uh, as a let's say a minor but still important um, uh, competitor to the French academic system. In the same year that Corbet painted a burial at Ornan, he painted this work called the Stonebreakers. Um, the Stonebreakers is a work that was destroyed during World War II, so we have some bad photos of it, but not much else. But it's the most kind of overt of his social messages in his early work. Um, like most Corbet's work, the subject matter is taken from the lower classes, but unlike Mie's work in the Stonebreakers, what you're looking at here are an old man and a younger boy who are doing very, very difficult back-breaking labor Believe it or not, people used to make gravel by hand. They're taking big rocks and they're hitting them with hammers until they're gravel. And then they're carting this gravel out to help make the grand boulevards that were moving into Paris. Um, and that's important here because what Corbet wants to say is that, you know, the economic system as it exists demands cheap labor. So the boulevards, these grand uh, streets that are being built, in fact, the entire renovation of Paris uh, can only happen if you have access to cheap labor. And thus, by extension, he wants to say, we all in society um, actually implicitly support the social stratification of our society because we want that cheap labor out there to, you know, to, to build the roads, to build the buildings. Uh, if we don't have it, um, you know, these things won't get done. And thus, it's to our benefit to keep low class people or people without much money in their position in society. So we have that access to cheap labor. He wants us to know this because he wants us to all feel implicated in the difficult situation that these people find themselves in. And unlike Mie's work, right, if we juxtapose these for a minute, like the sewer where the guy's doing difficult work, but he's singing his day away and having fun and, you know, doesn't have a care in the world. In the Stonebreakers, we see people who, if you were able to see this up close, um, whose hands are, you know, I'm just going to get us in close here for a minute, whose hands are gnarled and cracked, right? Whose clothing is literally falling off their backs, who in order to, you know, have a little bit of comfort and made these makeshift little pillows out of grass to support themselves whose shoes are falling off their feet. This is a really difficult life, right? This isn't something simple and they're doing a really difficult job. I don't know if you've ever hammered for a day. I'm sure some of you have, um, but I don't care how long you hammer uh, in your life. You hammer long enough in one day and your, your fingers just go numb. Imagine hitting a rock day after day after day to create gravel really difficult job. So that's part of it, right? We look at their difficult life. We say, how hard is this? We look at, for instance, a young boy and an older man, and we think, you know, it's just a matter of years before this young boy just turns into this old man and another young boy takes his place. 
unless we do something to change their way of life. We look at this picture with these dull colors. Everything's kind of depressing with these big descending shadows coming into the space. Everything depressing. And we realize that the little corner of light over here is just that little glimmer of opportunity that exists for them. But they're going to need our help to change you know, their lot in life. And that's what Corbet's about. He's about showing us the plight and difficulty of the lower classes in such an extreme way, especially for his time period, that we seek to do something to change their way of life. So I would love to spend more time on this, but I, I don't want to um, you know, bog down this lecture too much. This is a work from 1855 that's really important when it comes to its title. It's called um, Studio of a Painter. A real allegory summarizing my seven years of life as an artist. This is a work that was created. It's got a long kind of context to it. It was created in 1855, um, which is a really important date uh, for Corbet and for the art world. You see, in 1855, the big academic salon in Paris actually uh, fell on the same year that Paris was going to have what was known as the Paris Universal Exposition, or it's kind of like an early World's Fair. They started in the middle of the 19th century. And if you've ever seen World's Fairs, of course, for a while, they are the biggest thing going. There are these huge events where many times, many different nations show their works together um, in, in terms of art, in terms of sciences. There are huge pavilions to each nation. They're huge international events. And this, uh, in 1855, this event, this huge universal exposition happened the same year that the academic salon was going to happen for the painters and sculptors. And Corbet, knowing this, created this work specifically as a manifesto to realism. What I mean by a manifesto is it's showing you what realism is all about. Now, the other important thing about this painting is it's humongous. It's another giant painting. And in the academic salons, the big expo uh, expositions, um, there wasn't a lot of wall space. You've probably seen this before. It's called a salon style hang, where you hang multiple different paintings on a wall next to each other. These are all hung. Every salon was hung in the, the Louvre. And Corbet, when he um, submitted this work, and by this point, he is a really well-known name, very popular. Most of his works are getting accepted in the, uh, the academic salons, even though they're not classical works at all. Um, he insists that other earlier works that he had already exhibited get exhibited alongside this. And as a matter of fact, he says, I'm not going to show this work unless you also show a burial at Ornan and you show the Stonebreakers and a few other works that they had already shown years before. And the members of the French Royal Academy said, no way, we're not going to do that, which was probably exactly what Corbet was looking for. See, he wanted to create a little bit of a scandal. The, and, you know, the scandal was that the French Royal Academy, being too traditional and too conventional, refuses to show my work because they're afraid, um, you know, of what realism represents. Um, and so what he does is he gets Alfred Brouillas, his money man, to fund a separate realist pavilion to the arts right outside of the actual academic salon entry and the Universal Paris Exposition. And he hangs all of his most famous works in that, including that this work. Now, the reason I spend so much time on this is to alert you to something else. I've said this before, but it's going to be hard for you to kind of make sense of uh, in today's world. But the academic salon and its huge exhibitions were the one venue that you could show your art to the public at large and get a lot of people um, interested in your work. There wasn't the gallery system that there was today, and there were no other big expositions yet. And so Corbet's Realist Pavilion of 1855 that basically just showed his work was the first kind of alternative exhibition to the arts uh, in French history. Now, there, that's not exactly right, but that it's certainly the first big one. Now, onto the painting itself. In the middle, we see Corbet, uh, and he's painting a landscape scene. Behind him is a very realistic painting of a 
nude or maybe she's a naked woman. She looks like an everyday woman. She hasn't been idealized at all. And that's Corbet's way of critiquing the tradition of idealization in uh, classicism. Um, so he's going away at this. Um, Corbet, who was never uh, low uh, when it came to his own ego, of course, has everyone adoring his painting. A young child and the nude has stopped to adore his painting. Off to the right-hand side of the painting are all of what he called his stockholders, the people who support his art. So we see Charles Baudelaire over here. We see another collector of his work that you don't need to know. Um, this man is a critic here, that's Jean Fleury. We see Alfred Brouillas, the money man over here, other supporters to his art and who he affectionately called art lovers, young, rich couples who came to buy his art. On the other side of the painting are all of the subjects from which he takes um, his paintings. These are just scenes of everyday folk who he's come across uh, in his life who are the inspiration for his art. And up above is just his studio. Now the title of the work that says a real allegory summarizing my seven years of a, as an artist refers to the fact this was painted in 1855, right? So we go back seven years to 1848 and we say in 1848, Corbet's art took a turn and he got politically um, interested in social change through his art. So he's saying only for the last seven years have I really been an artist and it's all tied up with trying to show people the real world that they exist in so that they seek to change things that they find intolerable in that real world. Now, with all that being said, um, there are some other really interesting things that Corbet did. Realism is an interesting thing because unlike classicism, of course, there are no rules. You, can, you don't have to worry about whether your subject is grand you don't have to worry about whether everything that you produce in your art is um, about, um, you know, glorifying things or showing you the best of the world. Uh, instead, you can show the seedy underside of the world or, um, in this case, the hypocrisy of the French. Um, this is a work that's called Young Women on the Banks of the Seine. The Seine River is the river that runs through Paris. And what we see here are two prostitutes kind of sleeping it off in the early morning hours. Now, before this time, you would never show prostitutes uh, unless, of course, you veiled them or uh, disguised them as odalisque figures, as Aang did, and said, listen, we French don't treat our women as objects of desire or um, property that we own. But here Corbet points out that any morning, any time of the year, if you wanted to go see prostitutes on the banks of the Seine is where they hang out and you can go find them there. So the French really do treat their women in all the ways that Aang said that they didn't, right? Here are prostitutes uh, in France. We do also treat women poorly and, you know, they, they uh, are just like the lower classes. Um, really struggling for an alternative way of life. Also worth mentioning, Corbet's work, when it is erotic, is overtly erotic. He doesn't try to hide it. He doesn't try to say, no, 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 this is about chastity, or no, 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 this is about the way that, you know, Arab men treat their women. He just shows you a beautiful woman sleeping. Um, or, as you'll see coming up, uh, beautiful women doing various things and doesn't try to hide it. He says, and this is a pretty interesting thing to say in the 19th century, it might even be an interesting thing to say today, of course men are sexually attracted to women, of course we have fantasies, of course we like women for more than just beauty with a capital B, we like them because they're sensually, you know, exciting, we like them for erotic reasons in other words, and there's no reason a painter shouldn't paint that. Now, this is horrifying to the art establishment to think that art isn't lofty, that it could be something as vulgar or base as erotic, but Corbet paints it that way. So, for instance, this is just called Sleeping Blonde, or this one, which is called, preposterously, in my opinion, The Sleepers. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't think they're sleeping, right? So that's just my estimation, but he's titling it this so as to not kind of rub our noses in it, but it's just basically 
uh, an erotic picture of two nudes uh, lying in a bed kind of fondling each other. Or strangely, you know, this erotic, beautiful picture of a nude called woman with a parrot of all things, right? It's just beautiful women here. So my point in this is just to say that Courbet's realism is mainly about changing the plight of the lower classes, but it's also about what today we call desublimating uh, classicism. And sublimation is, the, is a kind of complex term. It's not at all related to the idea of the sublime, even though it sounds the same. Um, sublimation, which we may come across later in the quarter, is a term that just means um, taking something that is base or vulgar, as they would have said in the 19th century, like sex, and trying to transform that base, vulgar energy into something more lofty, like the subject of the female nude or beauty, per se. So sublimation is this idea that you, for instance, in, I mean, maybe one of the best examples is this one. Artists had always said that you know, they, they're they attracted to beautiful women, but what they do is they look at a beautiful woman as a model and then they transform that erotic energy into the creation of high art. Now what Corbet does is he reduces that uh, or reverses that process. Instead of trying to sublimate the nude, what he does is he creates just the erotic fantasy, just the desire that he has and he says, that's fine, right? That's good. That's, that's what human beings are like. That's real. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this week's lecture, um, and I will see you next week when we move on to Edward Manet and the Impressionists.